The following talk is taken from the Spirit Release Forum Conference held in London in June 2013 with the theme of Spirit Release, Helping Lost Souls Move Into the Light. This talk by Dr. Tom Zinzer is entitled Spirit Attachment, The Soul Connection. Uh, the timings, we've got two speakers that are all speaking synchronistically together. Um, <laughs> uh, this is all part of the wonders of you know, teleportation and sort of, no, it, effectively, um, uh, Sue will, our wonderful last speaker will be coming after Tom. Uh, and uh, as we're actually running 15 minutes late, what we're going to do is just probably slightly shorten the, uh, the closing ceremony. So it gives me a wonderful pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, who's come all the way from America, yes. first, Dr. Tom Zinza. Uh, I first came across Tom through his writings uh, in his book, which I will give another plug to, Soul Centered Healing. This, I think, should be um, one of the absolute required readings of anyone who's interested in spirit release. And one of the things which particularly inspired me about it all was not only the, the very thorough way in which Tom went about uh, working with his clients, but the fact that he was getting a lot of inspiration from another source of guidance. Um, and I have been very fortunate in my life to have access to similar sources of guidance, not only that have come through me directly, but also through some of the colleagues that I've been working with. Uh, and it is it's just staggering what that other level of perception can add to uh, our understanding and awareness. So it gives me great pleasure indeed to welcome Dr. Tom Zinzer. And, uh, and I'm very happy to talk. I hope so. Yes. Tom. <laughs> thank you very much. And I do want to thank David again for inviting me. It was really great to be here last year, and it's nice to be back this year seem familiar faces. Um, so I want to thank David and Frida and the uh, Spirit Forum for inviting me and making this possible. Um, last year, I know not everybody's here, um, just a couple of things for those who weren't. Uh, I do practice hypnotherapy, that, that is what I do, and my, that's where my work comes from, but I'm not going to be talking about this hypnotherapy. Um, you can read that in the book, or, um, but the information that I get, the experience I have, has been through hypnosis, working with clients, and that has basically been my work. Uh, my friend Jared is the spirit entity that I met in 1987, and Jared and I did work for 15 years. We met each week. Jared was channeled by a woman named Catherine. And the focus of my work with Jared was uh, e each week uh, talking about client cases, especially where I was running into trouble and things were happening that I didn't understand. And Jared and I also then talked about some of the broader metaphysical <coughs> issues, especially still as it pertained to therapy and, and healing. So I'm not going to get into the hypnotherapy, but just so you know that the information I'm talking about, this is what, that's where it came from. So last year, I, I talked about the boundary between the physical reality and the non-physical, what I term the psychic, the astral, the spirit. Um, that boundary uh, is something that modern psychology and modern psychiatry, at least in the States, and, I, and I'm thinking a lot here also, uh, that they will not cross that boundary. And they do not even really acknowledge that boundary. The, uh, they have labels for what happens on the other side. They call it psychosis, hallucination, delusion, or imagination, all of which comes down to saying it's not real. And modern psychology and psychiatry does not have the paradigm or the conceptual framework, I think, to really offer us an integrated vision of the person as a psychic and spiritual being, as well as 
a physical, emotional, psychological game. We spent our time here today on the other side of that boundary, and we're still there now. Uh, and it's not news to most of you here, as, as Free already began today, that uh, we have spirits with us here. And I would say most of those are our own spirit guides who have come with us. And of course, Frida invited them as well. And I would too. Um, there are uh, spirits that may be attached to this building or attached to these grounds. I suspect there may be uh, one or two of you who have brought spirits with you today that somehow have become involved in your life. And I'm pretty certain that there are spirits with us right now who are very curious about what's being said today. Because it does deal with them, and they, I believe, do have a very strong interest in uh, kind of what we've been talking about, developing more and more awareness that, hey, there's this connection here. Um, so, as a group, most of us recognize that spirits exist. And I have to follow my notes here. Um, I think the, one of the things is that we may not have a great deal of understanding about these realities and about these beings, but I believe that there really is more than enough evidence to say that they are real. And Terry, that's something you were speaking to. We do need to begin to study and begin to research the reality both the spirit reality and these beings. So, the second thing we recognize is not only that spirits exist, but that there is an interface. There, there is that place where spirits and humans come face to face, so to speak. And again, we uh, have so many people who report seeing ghosts and apparitions. So many people having visitations from deceased loved ones. Uh, people hearing disembodied voices, either reporting that coming from inside or they uh, talk about the voices coming from outside. And so many people also reporting at different times in their lives sensing these invisible presences. Um, what we don't know is what governs this interface. We don't know if there are certain conditions or factors with spirits that allow them at times to manifest. We don't know if there are certain conditions or factors about certain humans among us who are able to perceive these spirits, see them, hear them. We don't know if there is uh, some factors or conditions about the nature of these realities themselves that at times allow this boundary to become transparent. We just don't know a lot about that. To make it even more difficult, it seems that there are many doors and openings to other dimensions of consciousness and reality. That there are other beings who we interface with. And for convenience, I term them extraterrestrial and dimensional beings. Um, they too can present difficulty. We're not going to get into that today, but this is what makes this interface very complex and difficult, is how uh, these different entities do interface with us. Our focus today on spirits, though, we acknowledge that they exist, we recognize there's an interface, but we also recognize that there are interactions that occur across this interface, that they affect each other, we humans and spirits, that there is an interaction. And there are, <coughs> I think it would probably take us all day to list the a number of experiences we've heard from people, read about the unique events that people experience 
where there is interaction with spirits. And it comes in all kinds of ways. This is one of the frustrations, I think, for myself, at least in the States, is that all of this is reported, but it is really ignored or minimized. Um, it's this capacity and ability to interact with humans that makes spirits a clinical issue. Specifically, those interactions that are causing or negatively affecting people, consciously or unconsciously. Um, there are interactions with spirits that are causing confusion, anxiety, inner conflict, fear, even terror. Uh, there are interactions that uh, result in physical ailments bodily ailments and symptoms. There's, there's spirit interactions that also cause what I term energetic disturbances. And again, there are myriad people that are reporting or do report uh, being attacked, being plagued by, harassed, and even possessed by spirits. I believe there are just as many people, if not more, who are not aware that spirit interactions are the cause or a contributing factor to their own distress and difficulties. These are the kinds of interactions, unlike the benign ones, the positive ones, the helpful ones, it's these negative interactions that eventually can lead someone to seek help. And as healers and therapists, this is where we come in. I think there's some consensus today, and those of you uh, who are deal with spirits can kind of give your feedback, but I think there's some consensus today among those of us who do deal with spirits, therapists, healers, energy workers, soul rescuers, shamans, that the best way to deal with spirits is to send them. To the light. The fact that we're having this conference today, and that is the, the themes, sent, moving these spirits to the light. The fact that we are all gathered here today about this issue is, I think, what speaks strongly that there is this consensus. Now, in 1987, that's when I met my friend Jared, and we began our dialogues. In the very first or second time I talked with Jared, he told me the same thing. And I say he because Catherine believed that Jared was a masculine, felt like a masculine presence, but there's, it's not he or she. But we talked with Jared like a he. That this is one of the first things he said to me. I was talking with him about a spirit that appeared to be attached with a client. And he said that the very best thing you can do is send the spirit to the light. And I want to read, um, this is from the second, I know some of you have read my book. No, I think I'm going to take this curl. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of you have read the book, you know that I did automatic writing, Catherine did automatic writing, with Jerry on the first maybe four sessions I had with him. And then she was able to start channeling Jared verbally. That was like light years, a leap, in terms of how much I could communicate with him. This is from the second verbal session. We were talking again about earthbound spirits. And he said at some point, all souls have within them that potential to develop their very, very, very highest level. The earthbound spirit is the soul that has forgotten what it is supposed to do or never quite knew what it was supposed to do, and it has a potential for very high level work, just as any soul does. And that's why any soul that is earthbound, you are doing them a great service when you can send them on their way to the light. They deserve that help too. 
it wasn't long after these first sessions with Jared that I began to practice this. That when I encountered a spirit in my work, uh, the thing that I would do is immediately try to send them to the light. The good news is that we don't have to know all about these spirits, this complex interface, all the kinds of interactions that go on between humans and spirits in order to work with this therapeutically. Our aim is to identify when a spirit is present, negatively affecting a person, and then take steps in, in one way or the other to stop it. So from a, ours is a much more narrow perspective. It's, it is a clinical perspective. If spirits are present, then we work to try to move them on. What, what we learn as clinicians, I think, can add significantly to the body of knowledge having to do with spirit realm and spirit beings. But that, that isn't our focus. So from a clinical point of view, it's, basic, it's two basic questions. Are spirits present and causing distress for our patient? And if so, what can we do to stop it? That, that is really where I work. That's, that's my perspective. Uh, I'm very interested in all these other interactions, all, all these other kinds of phenomena, but clinically, which, which is kind of what I can talk about, that's the focus, those two questions. Is there a spirit present that's affecting some of my patients, and what can we do to stop it? <coughs> now, I want to share with you the protocol that I use that any time I encounter a spirit or spirits that are present with a patient. And again, this protocol developed out of my work with Jared probably over several years. Um, spirits, of course, was only one of the phenomena we dealt with, but it took me many dialogues with Jared and, and many, many patients to begin to uh, get clear on how to deal with this, what, what it was I was seeing. So this is the protocol that developed out of that collaboration. And it begins with engaging the spirit, and again, this is through hypnosis. And I would say that in the hypnosis, when a person is in trance, it does allow that interface to open. And that's, that's extremely important, and I have communicated with hundreds of spirits. And it's through that modality that, that I do that. I do not have a psychic, I don't see spirits, I don't hear spirits. Uh, you're talking about somebody who, uh, this came you know, from Jared and from clients, it was, not my, it was not my perception. So in some ways I think that's a positive because I suspect 85, 90% of us may not see spirits and hear spirits and I'm one of them. So what I learned and what the information that came out, came out not because I was seeing it, but because this is what was happening with either with Jared or with my clients. So the first step is to engage the spirit, move through those steps, uh, questions and steps, so that re it results in the spirit disengaging from my client. So again, a very narrow therapeutic aim, that's the aim, to have this spirit or spirits disengage from the client. What I learned was that sending a spirit to the light was the most effective and efficient way to do that. I discovered that uh, when a spirit was able to see the light, when directed to, and again, in communicating with spirit, I would ask it to turn towards the light. When a spirit was able to see the light, then it would leave. And what I saw happen when one spirit saw the light is that there was an immediate transformation. That spirit went from resistant or hesitant or hostile or one to fight. There would be an immediate transformation in which in my work with the client, all of a sudden that spirit has become cooperative. And as I think Archie mentioned, Often, when that happened, they were already gone. They saw the light and they were gone. Uh, but those that didn't 
um, there was some opportunity for me to communicate further with them, but they were then willing to go to the light. So that was, that was a huge uh, step for me to learn, is that if they could see that light, our problems were solved. <laughs> um, I liken the Spirit's transformation that I saw happen. I liken that to the reports of people who have had the near-death experience. And these people, as you all know, they talk about entering into that light and when they do, that they experience this infinite love, this peace. They talk about what I can only describe as a kind of cosmic understanding and consciousness. They understand what their life has been about. They understand the interconnection of souls. When they come back into the body, of course, they can't bring all that with them, and they struggle. They tell you, I cannot put this into words. But well, we've all, I think, probably here read enough to know that these people are transformed. And when they come back, there's no fear of death. They've, they've got renewed purpose in their life. I think this is what happens. I'm almost sure this is what happens when a spirit sees the light. It has this same kind of transformation. And fortunately for them, they do not have to come back. They are welcomed into the light. But it is that kind of transformation I'm convinced happens to them. From a clinical point of view, this is the problem solved for the client. The spirit, we get to help this soul, a lost or earthbound soul, return to his home in the light. But at the same time, it is disengaging from the client. And when it disengages from the client, it is also bringing to an end that negative interaction. And that, again, is, is the aim. So if I can uh, help direct the spirit to the light, in my mind, what I'm really also doing is helping my patient be relieved of this kind of interaction. And with some spirits, it is that easy. I encounter them in my work, direct them to the light, and they're gone, or very shortly, they're moving to the light. And uh, I'm going to go back to Terry and Archie with percentages. Only my percentages are kind of a guess. But I would say, uh, in my work, maybe 40 to 50% of the spirits I encounter are able to see that light when directed to. And the, these numbers are real estimates but maybe 40 to 50% on that first contact are able to see the light. What Jared said is happening is that when the spirit sees that light, it begins to remember. And in the remembering, in contact with that light, it is contacting the divine light, the divine love. And it is also beginning, it resonates. It resonates to that light because of their own light that they carry inside. It, it's, it's an automatic. It begins to resonate to it, remember it, and begins to remember its place in the light. And that's how Jared, at least if I kind of sum up his words over many sessions, this is what he was talking about as far as what happens with these spirits when they make that contact with the light. But, not all spirits see this light. When I encounter a spirit and ask that it look to the light, there are many times when it will communicate that it does not see the light. What this means, and I'll talk about some of the difficulties with that in a minute, but what that means is that these spirits need assistance in finding that light. Now, the second thing I learned from Jared, after running into these problems, Jared said to uh, communicate to the spirit and have it look inside. And what he was talking about is to direct the spirit to look inside and find its own light. That every soul, every spirit is a soul that has the light inside, that this is its soul source energy, 
So he said, direct the spirit to look inside and find its own life. So that was the, the second kind of major thing that he instructed me on as far as helping these situations when they came up and the spirit couldn't find the life. <coughs> I would say that using this tactic, if the spirit couldn't find the light, but when instructed to look, if it was willing to look inside, I would say that most of the time it found that light, if it was willing. And I, I'm more than convinced that's exactly what is there for them. That that light is there, it exists inside them, and if they're willing, that they're going to find it. Uh, and the thing is, when they looked inside, found that light, they experienced the same transformation that I just talked about. The very same thing. When they found that inner light, again, it's as if they were awakened, enlightened. They began to do that remembering. They remembered who they are. Um, so it was the same thing. So if they could not see the light when first directed, if you direct them to look inside for that light, the same transformation occurred. <clears throat> so, direct, directing the spirits this way to look inside increased the percentage of the number of times that I encountered a spirit and was able, fairly quickly, to be able to direct it to the light, find its own light, and go through that transformation, and again, they would be gone. They would leave. Over the months with Jared, I learned about a second way to help a spirit make contact with the light. <clears throat> if a spirit cannot find its own inner light, either because of its own fear, its own defenses, or it's being threatened by other spirits, then what Jerry suggested is to call on a spirit teacher in the light, a spirit guide, to come forward and make contact with the spirit. And again, if a spirit was willing to have that contact, and it had to be willing, and this is one of the, the issues when we, at least some people, write about how many earthbound spirits, like in the graveyard, but other, other places. Um, there are many earthbound spirits that are kind of hanging around. The thing is, spirit guides, because of the soul's absolute free choice, will not violate that choice and intrude on those spirits. They won't approach those earthbound spirits, knock them on the head and say, hey, look, come with us. It has to be the spirit and its free will choice to make that contact. So when Jared's talking to me about having them make contact with a spirit guy from the light, it involves that spirit I'm working with to give its consent, to be willing to, and say yes. And when they do, that contact will happen. Uh, it's, as if, it's as if these spirits in the light are just waiting for the opportunity to make that contact. But again, they won't do it, they won't violate that soul, they'll wait until they're asked. And, and, and this is the problem, these, these spirits do not know that they have the ability or the right to call for their loved ones or call for spirit guides or teachers, they don't know that they can do that. And that, that's part of their kind of lost state. And I've seen these contacts happen in, in all kinds of ways in my work. Um, in terms of the particular situation the spirit is in and how it needs to have a contact and who will contact it. Many of these spirits will have uh, contact by loved ones in the life. But there are others who will see an angel. Some will see a religious figure like Jesus. Some will see uh, kind of a large beam of light that, that emanates pure love. Uh, so the contact can happen in all kinds of ways. 
But the, the important issue is that as soon as that spirit says yes and has a contact, this is that same contact with light, and it is the same transformation again as I just talked about. It's almost as if any contact like this with the light, whether they see it, whether they find it inside themselves, or whether they have a spirit guide make the contact, it's that same contact with light that connects to their own light inside. And they begin to resonate. And again, it's really the light that is doing all the work. Uh, for someone like myself, as a healer, uh, I, I'm, I'm the facilitator. I'm the ferryman. I'm the go-between. It's the light that does the work. And as soon as they make contact with that light, again, just like the near-death experience reports, it begins to happen. They begin to awaken to who they are. Now, these are the first kind of three steps in the protocol that I use. When I know I'm in contact with the spirit, I'll see if they can see the light. If it cannot, the second thing is, I will direct it to look inside and find its own light. And if there is difficulty with that, then I will ask whether it's willing to receive information or communication from a high-level teacher. So those, those are the three steps. Most of the time, if a spirit on one of those steps does not immediately go to the light, I will try to do both steps with the client in the spirit that's present, and that is have them look inside. And even if they find that light inside and they're still present, I will try then to have them uh, have contact with the spirit guide directly, because I've found that that really just smooths the operation tremendously <coughs> from them kind of awakening to who they are and knowing that they've got contacts and loved ones already waiting for them. So it's not like that has to, all those, the both steps have to be done, but I think it just is a very helpful, clean way to do it. And, uh, and for the spirit, it, it kind of helps give, uh, set them on their way. So those are the steps in the protocol. And if I go back to percentages again, I would say in my work, these steps work about 70% of the time. Uh, and again, that's a guess, but 70% of the time. The real problem comes when spirits say no. I'm communicating with them, <laughs> asking them to see the light, or look inside, and they refuse. They're not going to do it. That's probably the biggest issue when it comes to working with spirits. The saying in it, where I come from, and, and maybe you have it here, is that the devil is in the details. And that is true here. And it is sometimes literally true. Okay. It is in the details when you're running into these spirits that are saying no. When I encounter either of these situations, uh, no, first, there are spirits who are willing to look inside, they are willing to receive contact from the spirit guide, but then it's not happening. In, in the hypnosis session, that's what we direct them to do. They're willing, and it doesn't happen. And the other situation are those spirits who are outright refuse any contact with the light. So in either of these situations, there are two different strategies two different sets of questions depending on whether the spirit's willing and it's just not happening or whether the spirit is refusing. But the underlying strategy, the next step in the protocol, is to determine why that spirit is refusing. What is its situation? Why is it refusing what to us would be a safe thing to do? So that's the next step in the protocol, identify and find out why this spirit is saying no. 
And this is where it gets into the details. Um, there, are, there are so many situations where this happens. One of the most common is that spirits that I have encountered uh, who are refusing the light are refusing because of their fear of punishment, judgment and punishment should they go to the light. They're afraid because of the life that they've lived in which they remember things that they've done and they, as, I, as we know, they've probably been taught, but they believe that if they go to the light, they're going to get it. That they're going to be judged, they're going to be punished. Uh, this is not uncommon in our culture because so many people with the belief in hell and damnation, this is what many are taught and this is what many die with, with that belief. So in a situation like that, I will talk to the spirit and let it know that there is no judgment in the light. That the only judgment that happens in the light is the soul's judgment of itself. And I will reassure it that there's no one else there to judge it. Um, then I will also, at that same time, let them know that there is a high level teacher in the light that is willing to come forward and communicate more information to them about this. So I, I want them to know that they can have this contact and what I'm offering them is more information about this very thing that they don't have to be afraid. And that's a positive message to these spirits. They don't all believe it right off, but if they will have that contact with the teacher I will ask that spirit teacher, I will ask them to turn towards the light, and I'll ask that spirit teacher to step forward, and when it does, I'll ask the teacher to communicate to this spirit more information and knowledge now about what happens in the light, the place that is waiting for them, and I'll ask the teacher to reassure them about this issue of judgment. And again, I don't see what's going on, I don't know what's going on, all I know is when that communication takes place, the transformation happens again. This spirit is reassured. It's kind of like, okay, I see. And they're ready to go. Um, a second one, the second issue where spirits are saying no, uh, is those spirits that I ask to look inside. Again, they, they can't see the light <clears throat> at first. I ask them to look inside and find their own light. They agree to do that, and again, I ask that that start, and fairly quickly I get the signal that that has stopped. And when I communicate to them, uh, what I hear or uh, get from their communication is they did see that light, and as they began to inside, and as they moved toward it, they stopped it. My question when, when it stopped is, uh, to this spirit, did you need to stop that light? Or did someone or something interfere? So when they communicate to me that they stopped the light, what I often find out is that as they got closer to that light, they began to remember some kind of trauma, uh, severe pain that they had gone through. And with that pain, they now have stopped their connecting with that light in order to stop their pain. And more often than not, they are viewing the light as the cause of the pain. So they look for their light, they begin to feel the pain, and it's the light that's causing their pain. But in fact, what's happening is the light, in which all is revealed, begins to reveal their own inner pain, but they're not aware at that moment about that. They see the light is causing the pain. And I will explain to them that, hey, the light is not causing your pain here. That pain has lived inside you. You are carrying that pain. And there is a way to be free of it. And again, I will ask if they'll receive a contact, a communication, where I'll say to them, there is a teacher or a loved one in the light that wants to give you more information about this. 
and that they will give the information that you do not have to carry this pain in you. You can be free. So again, that's one of the things that can happen when you direct them to find their own light, it triggers their pain, and then they stop it. Another one that's uh, frequent are spirits who say no because they're angry with God. And they blame God for what's happened. And for example, um, a spirit may communicate that it's angry with God because uh, in its lifetime, their entire family was massacred along with other villagers while they were gone. And when they came back, this is what they found. And they blame God for what happened and the loss of their family. And they don't want anything to do with God. They're angry with God. Uh, this is another, I wouldn't say it's common, but often enough. There's a spirit that's angry with God and blaming the light for what's happening. And, uh, in that kind of situation, it, again, I would say most of the time, in those situations, I do not try to explain to this spirit. Um, I basically will ask them, again, to receive a contact from a spirit teacher or a loved one. The one thing I will do in these cases, and not just, not just spirits angry with God, spirits who have also gone through tremendous grief and loss of a loved one, death of a loved one, when I uh, encounter a spirit like that, one of the first things I'll do is to let them know your loved ones are not dead. Those souls are still alive. They're not lost to you. And I'll go further and tell them that uh, those souls are in the light and more than likely they're waiting for you right now. And I will say to them, would you like one or more of them to come forward from the light right now to make a contact? And of course, most of the time, it's a yes. And that's what I'll do. I'll ask the person's higher self, the guides that are working with us, to please call to the light for this one's loved ones to come forward. And when they see that loved one, again, the transformation happens, and very soon or right then, they're gone. They're, they're going with their loved ones. Um, that's the, the, the thing I had to learn early on was in calling for these loved ones to come forward is that uh, in the beginning I just did not take into account that there are some of their loved ones, I mean some of these spirits have been around for five, in our space time, they've been around earthbound for five, six hundred years. I, I have to be careful not to promise a contact from one particular loved one. So I can't meet a spirit like this who's lost a loved one and say, uh, you know, we're going to call for your wife or your husband or your parent. I have to always give some possibilities. So I will say, you know, there's a parent, a child, a grandmother, a grandfather, kind of about five possibilities. And would you like to see, have contact with the loved one? So, because we don't know when one of those loved ones has reincarnated and isn't available at the moment. So, you have to give some possibilities, leave some room to maneuver there. Um, so, there, there are so many of these situations. A spirit may hound an individual out of revenge, it may stay close to someone in order to feed its addiction that it died with. A mother may stay earthbound in order to try to take care of a child. Um, a spirit may target a particular individual because of the energy that it can take from that individual. Uh, a spirit may refuse to acknowledge or just not been aware that its own body has died <coughs> and it's looking for a body. These are all situations where a spirit may refuse to see the light. Um, an interesting back when, again, early when I was starting with Jared, and I had a, a client who had an earthbound spirit with him. And this spirit, Timothy, joined my client in the hospital shortly after his birth, and so had been with him 
And my client at the time was maybe like 25. So this spirit had been with him the whole time. And um, this is one of my clients who could verbalize. We didn't have to use finger signals. Um, my client could verbalize in trance. Well, this spirit could verbalize in trance. And I had a long dialogue with this spirit because I was just trying to learn what's going on here. And what this, this is what this spirit said. Uh, this is right before he left for the light. I just want to explain something to you, what his anxiety is like. And my client, this is one of his, his symptoms, extreme anxiety. So he says, I just want to explain something to you, what his anxiety is like. It's like it forms a body for me. It gives me feeling because it is so overwhelming. I feel, even though I'm not in his body, but by his body, it makes me feel like I have a body. And I guess that is the thing that is tying me to him. All I can say is it forms a network, not just an energy, but a body. Now that is just one earthbound spirit trying to describe his experience of using my client's energy to, to have a body. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> um, Real quick, a fourth kind of situation are those spirits, um, this happened last year, talking about darkness and evil. Uh, we get to the end, next time I'm going to talk about it in the beginning. Um, <laughs> spirits who, are, who have become entangled or enslaved in darkness, who are controlled by dark souls. Um, this is one of the more difficult situations when spirits are refusing the light. Um, boy, this is too much to try to get into, but these, these dark souls will, uh, through deception, through all kinds of means, try to control these earthbound spirits, pull them in, and have them enslaved. And when you're encountering this kind of spirit who's been enslaved, uh, the, the message is still always the same. You are a soul. You are a being of light. You have that light inside you. You have always been a part of the light. It is the same message. And then the issue is to help that spirit understand that it has the right and ability to move out of that enslavement in an instant, if it chooses. And in my book, I talk about this issue, which turned out to be fairly critical, is that uh, these spirits often believe they are uh, involved in a deal, or they've made a deal or a contract with these dark souls. And these dark souls will promise the spirit a number of things. They'll promise them immortality, they'll promise them to help them get revenge. They make a promise, and these souls, in their vulnerability, will accept that. But the problem is, outside time and space, once they make a deal like this, that deal to them is in force forever. There's no end. And so dealing with spirits who are refusing the light, enslaved in darkness, this is the issue, making sure they get this message that they have that light inside and they can end the contract at any moment they choose. And again, uh, I will let them know that there are spirit teachers in the light that are immediately ready to come to them and will communicate more understanding to them about this. And in that way, in communicating with the spirit will help them. And they do. They want to break these contracts. Once you get to them and they, they begin to believe that they can do this, they want out of these contracts. They want out of this darkness. So that's, that's kind of a fourth and very difficult situation, but it's the same message, it's the own light that they can connect with. So I'll skip to conclusion. <laughs> uh, because I think it's an important conclusion, and it's one I want to emphasize that, that the other truth that is contained in, in the practice of sending spirits to the light is that what applies to these spirits 
applies to every one of us. That we are incarnate souls and we have that light within us. Same, same thing. And at the time of death, we should know that the best thing we can do is go on to the light. We know, for instance, that many people on their deathbed are approached by loved ones or spirits. Uh, in nursing homes, it, God, I wish they would pay attention to this. People are visited, they're preparing, and spirit guides are present to help with that transition. <clears throat> and so I'm sure we've all heard that this happens. Um, and for most of us here, this is already a given. At the time of our death, what we need to do is just step through that door, that it's there. And we have loved ones waiting for us. Now, I don't know how many here, I don't know if it's 100%, but I think most of you probably already connect with us. Um, I guess what I, I would say in the end is that what needs to happen is for this knowledge to be brought to the public. It really needs to, the public needs to begin to understand that th these, this doorway is waiting for every one of us. And uh, we know what the fear of death today does in our culture. It's just horrendous what the fear of death does to people. And so this message really needs to be brought to the public. And talking about spirit attachment, spirit possession, uh, spirit inhabitation, uh, is one of the ways to begin to get this information out there that what's true for these spirits is true for us. And I think that's a message that, that more and more energy needs to be brought into. Thank you very much. I just say that his books, um, not only the one I mentioned before, but his uh, Practical Soul Centered uh, Healing book, uh, Approach Goals, is available. Um, we also have a DVD set, because last year Tom did uh, a whole day workshop, and we've got this now on four DVDs. It costs £25. I've got three copies here, um, and if any of you want uh, to order some, you certainly can. So, once again, Tom, thank you very, very much for all that you've shared. <laughs>